Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachian family and are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height and lording it over the surrounding country. Every change of season, every change of weather, indeed every hour of the day, produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains. At the foot of these fairy mountains, the voyager may have descried the light smoke curling up from a village whose shingle roofs gleam among the trees. In that same village, and in one of these very houses, which to tell the precise truth, was sadly time-worn and weather-beaten, there lived many years since, while the country was yet a province of Great Britain, a simple, good-natured fellow of the name of Rip Van Winkle. He was, moreover, a kind neighbor and an obedient hen-pecked husband. Indeed, to the latter circumstance might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity. For those men are most apt to be obsequious and conciliating who are under the discipline of shrews at home. Their tempers, doubtless, are rendered pliant and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation. Rip's sole domestic adherent was his dog Wolf, who was as much henpecked as his master, for Dame Van Winkle regarded them as companions in idleness. The great error in Rip's composition was an insuperable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor. It could not be from the want of assiduity or perseverance. He would carry a fowling piece on his shoulder for hours trudging through woods and swamps and up hills and down dale to shoot a few squirrels or wild pigeons. He would never refuse to assist a neighbor even in the roughest toil and was a foremost man at all country frolics for husking Indian corn or building stone fences. In a word, Rip was ready to attend to anybody's business but his own, but as to doing family duty and keeping his farm in order, he found it impossible. He declared it was of no use to work on his farm. It was the most pestilent little piece of ground in the whole country. Everything about it went wrong and would go wrong in spite of him. His fences were continually falling to pieces. His cows would either go astray or get among the cabbages. Weeds were sure to grow quicker in his fields than anywhere else. It was the worst conditioned farm in the neighborhood. His children, too, were as ragged and wild as if they belonged to nobody. His son Rip, an urchin begotten in his own likeness, promised to inherit the habits with the old clothes of his father. Rip was one of those happy mortals of foolish, well-oiled dispositions who take the world easy, eat white bread or brown, whichever can be gotten with least thought or trouble, and would rather starve on a penny than work for a pound. If left to himself, he would have whistled life away in perfect contentment. But his wife kept continually dinning in his ears about his idleness, his carelessness, and the ruin he was bringing on his family. Morning, noon, and night her tongue was incessantly going, and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence. Rip had but one way of replying to all lectures of this kind, and that, by frequent use, had grown into a habit. He shrugged his shoulders, shook his head, cast up his eyes, but said nothing. Times grew worse and worse as years of matrimony rolled on. A tart temper never mellows with age, and a sharp tongue is the only edged tool that grows keener with constant use. For a long while he used to console himself by frequenting a kind of perpetual club of the sages, philosophers, and other idle personages, which held its sessions on a bench before a small inn designated by a Rubicon portrait of His Majesty George III. Here they used to sit in the shade through a long, lazy summer's day, telling endless stories about nothing. From even this stronghold, the unlucky Rip was at length routed by his termagant wife, who would suddenly break in upon the tranquility of the assemblage and call the members all to naught. Poor Rip was at last reduced almost to despair, and his only alternative to escape from the labor of the farm and clamor of his wife was to take a gun in hand and stroll away into the woods. 
Here he would sometimes seat himself at the foot of a tree and share the contents of his wallet with Wolf, with whom he sympathized as a fellow sufferer in persecution. Poor Wolf, he would say, thy mistress leads thee a dog's life of it. But never mind, my lad, whilst I live thou shalt never want a friend to stand by thee. In a long ramble of the kind on a fine autumnal day, Rip had unconsciously scrambled to one of the highest parts of the Catskill Mountains. Panting and fatigued, he threw himself late in the afternoon on a green knoll covered with mountain herbage that crowned the brow of a precipice. From an opening between the trees, he could overlook all the lower country for many a mile of rich woodland. He saw at a distance the lordly Hudson, far, far below him, moving on its silent but majestic course with the reflection of a purple cloud or the sail of a lagging bark, here and there sleeping on its glassy bosom and at last losing itself in the blue highlands. On the other side, he looked down into a deep mountain glen, wild, lonely, and shagged, the bottom filled with fragments from the impending cliffs and scarcely lighted by the reflected rays of the setting sun. For some time, Rip lay musing on this scene. Evening was gradually advancing. The mountains began to throw their long blue shadows over the valleys. He saw that it would be long before he could reach the village, and he heaved a heavy sigh when he thought of encountering the terrors of Dame Van Winkle. As he was about to descend, he heard a voice from a distance hallowing, Rip Van Winkle, Rip Van Winkle. He looked around, but could see nothing but a crow winging its solitary flight across the mountains. He thought his fancy must have deceived him and turned again to descend when Rip Van Winkle, Rip Van Winkle. Rip now felt a vague apprehension stealing over him. He looked anxiously in the same direction and perceived a strange figure slowly toiling up the rocks and bending under the weight of something he carried on his back. He was surprised to see any human being in this lonely and unfrequented place, but supposing it to be someone of the neighborhood in need of his assistance, he hastened down to yield it. On nearer approach, he was still more surprised at the singularity of the stranger's appearance. He was a short, square-built old fellow with thick, bushy hair and a grizzled beard. His dress was of the antique Dutch fashion, a cloth jerkin strapped around the waist, several pair of breeches, the outer one of ample volume, decorated with rows of buttons down the side and bunches at the knees. He bore on his shoulders a stout keg that seemed full of liquor and made signs for Rip to approach and assist him with the load. Though rather shy and distrustful of this new acquaintance, Rip complied with his usual alacrity, and mutually relieving one another, they clambered up a narrow gully, apparently the dry bed of a mountain torrent. As they ascended, Rip ever now and then heard long rolling peals like distant thunder that seemed to issue out of a ravine, or rather cleft between lofty rocks to which their rugged path conducted. He paused for an instant, but supposing it to be the muttering of one of those transient thunder showers which often take place in mountain heights, he proceeded. Passing through the ravine, they came to a hollow like a small amphitheater, surrounded by perpendicular precipices, over the brinks of which impending trees shot their branches, so that you only caught glimpses of the azure sky and the bright evening cloud. On entering the amphitheater, new objects of wonder presented themselves. On a level spot in the center was a company of odd-looking personages playing at nine pins. One had a large beard, broad face, and small piggish eyes. The face of another seemed to consist entirely of nose and was surmounted by a white sugar loaf hat set off with a little red cock's tail. They all had beards of various shapes and colors. There was one who seemed to be the commander,
He was a stout old gentleman with a weather-beaten countenance. He wore a lace doublet, broad belt and hanger, high-crowned hat and feather, red stockings, and high-heeled shoes with roses in them. What seemed particularly odd to Rip was that though these folks were evidently amusing themselves, yet they maintained the gravest faces, the most mysterious silence, and were, with all the most melancholy party of pleasure he had ever witnessed. Nothing interrupted the stillness of the scene but the noise of the balls which, whenever they were rolled, echoed along the mountains like rumbling peals of thunder. As Rip and his companions approached them, they suddenly desisted from their play and stared at him with such fixed statue-like gaze and such strange, uncouth, lackluster countenance that his heart turned within him and his knees smote together. His companion now emptied the contents of the keg into large flagons and made signs to him to wait upon the company. He obeyed with fear and trembling. They quaffed the liquor in profound silence and then returned to their game. By degrees, Rip's awe and apprehension subsided. He even ventured to taste the beverage, which he found had much of the flavor of excellent Hollands. He was naturally a thirsty soul, and one taste provoked another, and he reiterated his visits to the flagon so often that at length his senses were overpowered, his eyes swam in his head, his head gradually declined, and he fell into a deep sleep. waking, he found himself on the green knoll whence he had first seen the old man of the glen. He rubbed his eyes. It was a bright sunny morning. The birds were hopping and twittering among the bushes, and the eagle was wheeling aloft and breasting a pure mountain breeze. Surely, thought Rip, I have not slept here all night. He recalled the occurrences before he fell asleep. The strange man with a keg of liquor, the mountain ravine, the wild retreat among the rocks, the woe-begone party at nine pins, the flagon, oh, that flagon, that wicked flagon, thought Rip, what excuse shall I make to Dame Van Winkle? He looked round for his gun but in place of the clean, well-oiled fowling piece, he found an old fire lock lying by him, the barrel encrusted with rust, the lock falling off, and the stock worm-eaten. Wolf, too, had disappeared, but he might have strayed away after a squirrel or partridge. He whistled after him and shouted his name, but all in vain. The echoes repeated his whistle and shout, but no dog was to be seen. As he rose to walk, he found himself stiff in the joints and wanting in his usual activity. With some difficulty, he got down into the glen, but to his astonishment, a mountain stream was now foaming down it, leaping from rock to rock, and filling the glen with babbling murmurs. He, however, made shift to scramble up its sides, working his toilsome way through thickets of birch, sassafras, and witch hazel, and sometimes stripped up or entangled by the wild grapevines and twisted their coils or tendrils from tree to tree and spread a kind of network in his path. At length he had reached to where the ravine had opened through the cliffs to the amphitheater, but no traces of such opening remained. The rocks presented a high, impenetrable wall over which the torrent came tumbling in a sheet of feathery foam and fell into a broad, deep basin, black from the shadows of the surrounding forest. Here, poor Rip was brought to a stand. What was to be done? The morning was passing away and Rip felt famished for want of his breakfast. He grieved to give up his dog and gun. He dreaded to meet his wife, but it would not be to starve among the mountains. He shook his head, shouldered the rusty firelock, and, with a heart full of trouble and anxiety, turned his steps homeward. As he approached the village, he met a number of people, but none whom he knew which somewhat surprised him, for he had thought himself acquainted with everyone in the country round. Their dress, too, was of a different fashion from that to which he was accustomed. They all stared at him with equal surprise, and whenever they cast their eyes upon him, invariably they stroked their chins. The constant recurrence of this gesture induced Rip involuntarily to do the same, when to his astonishment he found his beard had grown a foot long. 
he had now entered the skirts of the village. There were rows of houses which he had never seen before, and those which had been his familiar haunts had disappeared. Strange names were over the doors, strange faces at the windows, everything was strange. His mind now misgave him. He began to doubt whether both he and the world around him were not bewitched. Surely this was his native village, which he had left but the day before. There stood the Catskill Mountains. There ran the Silver Hudson at a distance. Rip was sorely perplexed. That flagon last night out of my poor head sadly. It was with some difficulty that he found the way to his own house, which he approached with silent awe, expecting every moment to hear the shrill voice of Dame Van Winkle. He found the house gone to decay, the roof fallen in, and the doors off the hinges. A half-starved dog that looked like Wolf was skulking about it. Rip called him by name, but the cur snarled, showed his teeth and passed on. This was an unkind cut indeed. My very dog has forgotten me. He entered the house, which, to tell the truth, Dame Van Winkle had always kept in neat order. It was empty, forlorn, and apparently abandoned. He called loudly for his wife and children. The lonely chambers rang for a moment, and then all again was silence. He now hurried forth and hastened to his old resort, the village inn, but it too was gone. A large rickety wooden building stood in its place with great gaping windows, some of them broken and mended with old hats and petticoats, and over the doors were painted The Union Hotel by Jonathan Doolittle. Instead of the great tree that used to shelter the quiet little Dutch inn, there now was reared a tall, naked pole, and from it was fluttering a flag, on which was a singular assemblage of stars and stripes. All this was strange and incomprehensible. There was, as usual, a crowd of folk about the door, but none that Rip recollected. The very character of the people seemed changed. The appearance of Rip with his long, grizzled beard, his uncouth dress, and an army of women and children at his heels soon attracted the attention of the tavern politician. They crowded round him, eyeing him from head to foot with great curiosity. Rip stared in vacant stupidity. Another short but busy little fellow pulled him by the arm and rising on tiptoe inquired in his ear whether he was a federal or a democrat. Alas, gentlemen, cried Rip, somewhat dismayed, I am a poor, quiet man, a native of the place, and a loyal subject of the king. God bless him. Here a general shout burst from the bystanders, a Tory, a Tory, a spy, a refugee, away with him. Does anybody here know Rip Van Winkle? Oh, Rip Van Winkle, exclaimed two or three. Oh, to be sure, that's Rip Van Winkle yonder, leaning against the tree. Rip looked and beheld a precise counterpart of himself as he went up the mountain, apparently as lazy and certainly as ragged. The poor fellow was now completely confounded. He doubted his own identity and whether he was himself another man. I was myself last night, but I fell asleep on the mountain. The bystander began now to look at each other, nod, wink significantly, and tap their fingers against their foreheads. At this critical moment, a fresh, calmly woman pressed through the throng to get a peep at the gray-bearded man. She had a chubby child in her arms, which frightened his looks, began to cry. Hush, Rip, cried she. The old man won't hurt you. The name of the child, the air of the mother, the tone of her voice, all awakened a train of recollections in his mind. What is your name, my good woman, asked he. Judith Gardenier. And your father's name? Oh, poor man, Rip Van Winkle was his name. But it's twenty years since he went away from home with his gun. His dog came home without him. But whether he shot himself or was carried away by the Indians, nobody can tell. I was then but a little girl. 
Rip had but one question more to ask, but he put it with a faltering voice. Where's your mother? Oh, she too had died but a short time since. She broke a blood vessel in a fit of passion at a New England peddler. There was a drop of comfort, at least in this intelligence. The honest man could contain himself no longer. He caught his daughter and her child in his arms. I'm your father, cried he. Young Rip Van Winkle once, old Rip Van Winkle now. Does nobody know poor Rip Van Winkle? All stood amazed until an old woman, tottering out from among the crowd, exclaimed, Sure enough, it is Rip Van Winkle. It is himself. Welcome home again, old neighbor. Why, where have you been these twenty long years? Rip's story was soon told, for the whole twenty years had been to him but as one night. The neighbors stared when they had heard it. Some were seen to wink at each other and put their tongues in their cheeks. It was determined, however, to take the opinion of old Peter Vanderdunk, who was seen slowly advancing up the road. He was a descendant of the historian of that name who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the province. Peter was the most ancient inhabitant of the village and well versed in all the wonderful events and traditions of the neighborhood. He recollected Rip at once and corroborated his story in the most satisfactory manner. He assured the company that it was a fact, handed down from his ancestors the historian, that the Catskill Mountains had always been haunted by strange beings. It was affirmed that the great Hendrick Hudson, the first discoverer of the river and country, kept a kind of vigil there every twenty years with his crew of the Half Moon being permitted in this way to revisit the scenes of his enterprise and keep a guardian eye upon the river and the great city called by his name. To make a long story short, Rip's daughter took him home to live with her. She had a snug, well-furnished house and a stout, cheery farmer for a husband. He had got his neck out of the yoke of matrimony and would go in and out whenever he pleased without dreading the tyranny of Dame Van Winkle. Whenever her name was mentioned, however, he shook his head, shrugged his shoulders, and cast up his eyes, which might pass either for an expression of resignation to his fate or joy at his deliverance. He used to tell his story to every stranger that arrived at Mr. Doolittle's hotel. He was observed at first to vary on some points every time he told it. It at last settled down precisely to the tale I have related, and not a man, woman, or child in the neighborhood but knew it by heart.